All right, here we go. We've got the one and only Illy uh, in Melbourne. How you doing, bro? Good, man. Good to be here. Um, yeah, thank you for taking the time. As we mentioned before, there's been a bit of back and forth between you and Sam on the internet trying to tee it up. So we finally made it happen. So thank you very much, man. Yeah, no, I'm happy we were able to, to find, I'm happy we were finally able to link it up and make it happen, bro. It's, um, it's something I've been looking forward to. Now, um, before we get into your whole history, uh, you know, and, and everything that you've done up until this point, um, I wanted to start with, uh, the new single. Uh, like you, which I think you dropped a couple of weeks ago. That's right. Yeah, two, nearly three weeks ago. Now, um, I'm going to speculate that a new single means that there's a new EP, album, tour in the works, or am I just... You're a smart man. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, it's, it's the first look at a new, most likely a new album. Um, been working since the space between came out sort of started last year i've been pretty flat out in the studio and um it's starting to take pretty good shape so i don't think it's too far off um and and yeah i'm i'm, I'm, ex- I'm getting to the point in the album process where i'm excited about it bro which is always a, a good good sign that things are going well getting getting through it correct me if i'm wrong but you know if this uh you know when this album comes out that'll be album number seven for you that's right yeah wow so that's like seven <laughs> yeah, albums in yeah. yeah that's like seven albums in like 15 years or something like that seven albums in 13 years yeah long story short it was 2009 so by the time it, i mean it's not going to come out this year so yeah 14 years man it's um <laughs> yeah it's it's <laughs> it's fucked when you when you put it like that it's fucked but um yeah, it is what it is. I'm like I'm I'm fortunate and lucky and and grateful to still be here to put out a seventh album. Absolutely, man. There's not mm. many that you know. No. Longe- I think long longevity is something that um, doesn't get talked about enough in music. Uh, it's one of the hardest things to accomplish. I mean, I I you know I firmly I agree with that. I think that's been kind of. Without, you know, I'll let you ask the questions and I'm kind of answering a question you didn't ask, but um, I think that's like the most difficult thing is to, in anything, whether it's sport, I mean, in really in life, but you know, they say in sports, the hardest thing is not winning a title or a championship or whatever, it's doing it again. And, um, and longevity is definitely like an underrated characteristic of, of musicians, I think. Particularly nah, 100%, rap. man. Yeah particularly in rap because rap yeah. has that funny thing with age it's like as soon as you turn 30 it's like everyone says you're too old or some shit yeah <laughs> uh, that's yeah that's it and like people you know it's so hype driven um you can't be the hot young or the, you can't be the hot new act you can be whatever age but your your first moment introduction to the public and 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 people you can only have that once and then it's like what do you do after that because people have come and gone um you know so yeah it's it's maintaining that's that's the real challenge i think and so yeah no my hat goes off to you for being able to maintain it for so long and it doesn't look like you're going anywhere anytime soon so i reckon you might end up spanning 15 to 20 years but only time will tell Um, but yeah so i want to try to cover your story as best as we can um, front to back uh, from the very beginning and now to my understanding uh, you're born and bred in Melbourne uh, in particular you're from Frankston yeah Frankston train line so grew up between like the entirety of the train line sort of Caulfield to you know Caram Seaford Franger Cannanook like everywhere between is kind of where I spent my life um, you know my school years um, went to school in, in Mentone and then Sandy Sec. Um, you know, a lot of time in Chel. Like, yeah, the, the 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 whole of the train line is kind of where I came up. Um, a lot of the musicians were, were kind of not from that part of town, so me and my buddies kind of forged our own pathway. And um, yeah, it was like it was a good place to to start making music. There was a lot. Of, there was a lot of people that were into Aussie hip hop, and not a whole lot of 
people doing it. So, um, you know, you had people get around you pretty, you had a supportive sort of community around there when you were having a go, you know, because they wanted someone that they could get behind. Now, when I think of Frankston, um, because I used to live in Melbourne, but that was a while ago. Uh, Mm. When I hear the term Frankston, uh, one thing that comes to mind is deadly, Frankston flow. Yeah. Um, And the other thing that comes to mind is the neighborhood in itself. To my understanding, Frankston's got a bit of a reputation for being a rough area. Is that accurate? I mean, it's, it's a bit different now. Back, you know, when I was a kid, it had a, a much tougher rep, I think. I mean, gentrification has really happened because Frankston, it's a beautiful part of the city because it's on the bay. It's right at the end of a train line. And then, you know, 10 minutes from there, you've got like Mount Eliza, Mount Martha. You've got the peninsula, which has like always been super moneyed up. Um, so it was this weird thing of like being, you know, a bayside city uh that had a bad reputation and it was a tough place and Cannanook especially had a really bad rep but as you know more people have wanted to live by the sea and and, uh, by the bay sorry and you've like you know things have got more expensive it's become more of a hot spot and now it's a much nicer place um it still has the rough pockets but it's definitely um it's it's not it's definitely nicer than it was when i was growing up for sure so when, we, when you were growing up in Frankston, because I remember they had the Frankston Skate Park um, mm-hmm. and, you know, they used to tell me, like, don't go there by yourself after dark. Be careful when you're riding the Frankston line, etc. cetera. Mm. I never really had any issues myself. But mm. when you were growing up in that area, when you were younger, did you encounter any issues growing up there? Yeah, I mean, no, nothing too, like, hairy. You know, you're, when, you're, when you're young, like, you know, in high school, you know, 14 to... 17 18 and you're hanging out with you know not super hardcore dudes but you're not you're not hanging out with the the straight a students put it that way you like you're gonna come across shit but i don't think it's like anything you know i think a lot of people have similar stories wherever they sort of grow up you know so you kind of just know where to avoid you don't put yourself in anything too stupid a situation um i was friends with people that were in in like the graph scene a lot more than i was you know i was i was a fan of it but i was never one that was really getting amongst it rap was my main thing um i hustled on the side to make money but i was never out there you know doing the you know going fucking bombing and hitting the hit, hitting all that shit like I, I was kind of adjacent to it so yeah the music always came first to me you know and then the interesting thing is, uh, you know, if, you gr- if you're growing up around Frankston at that time, which had that, you know, reputation and you're hanging out with, you know, say the graffiti writers and the boys, uh, although that's all going on, you ended up um, going to university and mm. getting yourself a law degree. Yeah. So yeah. what made you, uh, what made you do that? Like what enticed you to go that route, particularly when, you know, you're hanging out with the writers and you know, doing your thing? What made you go law university? Well, I didn't have an an option, bro. So I, um, I finished school. I did really, like I didn't, I barely finished, got a really bad test score. It didn't leave me with any options for like, you know, further education. So I was working in a factory and just doing, you know, open mic nights four or five times a week. And just, that was my focus. But I really didn't know what I was going to do, you know, because at this point, I didn't even think, at this point, I don't even think the hoods, maybe the hoods would have just started to, you know, be making a career out of rap. Um, maybe Scribe in New Zealand was just starting to make a career, but it wasn't like something that you were doing with the, with the, there was no clear pathway to this being a job. So I was just doing it for the love and I didn't really know what I was going to do with my life. So I'm working in factories, doing furniture removals and a friend that I'd, um, that I'd gone to school with who, who was much more um, switched on he was doing like a, a commerce degree and he hit me up like, yo, you can sit this test. Cause I was just on the phone like, fuck, I hate my job. I don't know what I'm doing, blah, blah. And he was like, yo, you can sit this test. And I sat it and it was like a five hour exam. And they like, there was like five positions in uh, at law, studying law. And, um, and I got one of those five. There was probably like three, 400 people. I don't know. There was hundreds of people taking the test and I got one of the things. 
So then I had the option of, well, I can either keep doing what I'm doing or I can try this. And I'd always been interested in it. You know, I probably had like the Hollywood, um, the Hollywood idea of what a law career was. Um, and then I, on the first day, I'm like rocking up in my hoodie, fucking s smoked out, like with, with people that have all got like 99.9s on their fucking year 12 scores. So I was definitely the odd one out. And I was like, yo, this is not what I expected. Um, it was a pretty steep learning curve, but yeah, that's, that's kind of, I didn't have an option, long story short, I didn't have an option to do anything. And then I got that option and I was like, fuck it, I'm going to, I'm going to take that opportunity. Yeah. Right. So then obviously while you've been doing the law degree, you've already been rapping, music is already a part of your life. And then mm. you would have finished your law degree. I'm going to guess like around early twenties. Yeah, I I finished at twenty five or six, I think, because I like yeah, it would have been twenty around then, because I um I did it part time. I failed a bunch, so I had to repeat basically my entire first year, um, because I basically I'd never studied. You know, I'd, I'd spent all of high school just stoned and like not caring, and I had to teach myself how to study. And if you're going to teach yourself how to study. Uh, law degree is probably the the most intense way to do it um, so it was a pretty steep learning curve but yeah I, I failed a bunch and then I did it part-time so that I could pursue music because as I got later into my degree I was you know I was touring I'd um I put out albums um, and, and thankfully by the time I graduated you know I was already working on my third album and, and I was able to make a living barely but just able to get by off music. So it kind of took the pressure off having to find a job in, in law, which would have been fucked. <laughs> Somewhere in that, in that early phase where, you know, you're going to uni or you're, you're in high school, somewhere in there, you were part of a crew called Crooked Eye Crew and that had um, M phases and Phrase as part yes. of the crew? Yeah, so Crooked Eye was Merriweather, uh, Dan Merriweather, um, Phrase, Jan, uh, Jay Scoob, DJ Flagrant, and M Phases, um, and myself. And yeah, Phases came on a little bit later, but basically I'd been, you know, playing these open mic nights and around Melbourne, you know, sort of gold coin donations. And this is, you know, I came up with sort of 60 and Pez and Mantra and uh, you know, Iron Projects and like a lot, there was a lot of talent at that time, but we were all kind of like, there was sort of the, the more hardcore, under, everything was underground, but there was sort of the more, the, the sort of broken tooth dudes and, and the, they had their scene and our scene was very separate um, and ours was much smaller. Um, but you know, that's what we were kind of doing and, and Meriwether and Fraze came to one of the open mics one night and, I, and Dan saw me on stage, he kind of liked what I was doing, said come through to their studio. And they had a studio on Izzet Street where the old obese used to be, just down the road from obese. And, um, you know, I went in there and, you know, like that was my first experience with a real studio. And they kind of took me under their wing and I ended up hype manning for Phrase for 2006, 2007. Um, and, you know, that, that was kind of like, and 2000, into 2008 as well. And, that kind of um, was my apprenticeship really in, in music and they showed me the ropes and it was like, a, it, was a, it was such a good time because there was no expectation. I was just there and enjoying the ride and you know, I was, I was hustling back home to make money so that I could go there and do that. And, um, and, and yeah, it was, it, was just a, it was just fun, man. It, was like, it felt like the first step to, to making a real career in music. And then I think it was off the back of that that you dropped your first mixtape, like the Illy mixtape? That's right. Yeah, 2007 um, was the Illy mixtape and 2008 did volume two. So they were the first two sort of recorded things. Um, yeah, on CD, like <laughs> printing out mixtape CDs and handing them out at gigs, like a lost, a lost art form. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that was, that was the first releases I put out. And then not on that release, but around that time, so maybe just after that release in 07, you 
featured on a track, I think it was with Pegs and mm-hmm. Draft. Um, and that was on Pegs' album, Burn City. So how did you go from, you know, dropping this one mixtape to then linking up with someone like Pegs, who at the time was, you know, one of the biggest names in the whole country? Right. Well, yeah, man. I mean, like I said, our studio was, the Crooked Eye studio was just down from Obese. So if you, at that time, if you liked Australian hip hop and you were like a kid, everyone, you idolized Obese. And particularly if you're from Melbourne, like going to Is It Street and the store was like a pilgrimage, you know, you'd like, you'd be at school, you'd be like, yo, I'm going to go out there on the weekend and you just go in there and fucking talk shit. Uh, like bias or whoever would be behind the counter like people would be there Um, it was really like you just wanted to be around it so that was always the aim you know even at Crooked Eye I loved the boys um, and I loved like I I loved what they'd done for me but it became kind of apparent at some point that you know I I was only going to get so far staying with Crooked Eye and I'd known Pegs because we'd been so close in the studio, like because our studios had been so close, we'd often all be drinking in the park and you know, I had a chance to get in his ear and, and show him my mixtapes and blah, blah, blah. And he liked what I was doing. So he, you know, he offered me a deal. And, um, and yeah, part of that, like I guess part of the, the sort of process to, 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 to sway me to join Obese was, um, was getting me on, on his album. And um, I can't I can't remember the name of the track, but I know my verse. Um, Before I leave, is that what it's called? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I remember that. Um, yeah, man. I, I mean, that was that was kind of that was kind of how that came to be. And, and you know, everyone, like you say, everyone loved Axis and Capricorn Cat. And um, Pegs was, as far as Melbourne goes, you know, he he ran obese, so he was had the keys to the whole fucking country as far as Australian hip hop for 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 young Melbourne artists and fans. Yeah. And then, so as I'm looking at my notes, just in that early, you know, just those early stages for you when you've started recording and releasing, the pool of names that you're just around, you know, from the early days, like your M phases, your phrase, your pegs, your draft, Jace mm. of beat heads. It's mm. like you've really come up in very good Melbourne soil. Yeah, well, I mean, Phases moved down from Gold Coast in like 2007, and we'd like met prior to then, but he came down and Flago was DJing for Phrase. So I was the other dude in the crew. Meriwether had gone off to, to the UK at this, by this time. You know, he was doing his shit with Mark Ronson, and Phases came in and was like, all right, well, what are you going to do? He's like, well, I want to, I'll DJ for Al, you know? And I was like, yeah, let's do that. So it, like, it just was being in the right place at the right time. And, you know, like, you know, that's my, that's my homie from, from, from that day forward. You know, he's been instrumental in my career until the last album. Um, so it was just, you know, I was very fortunate to be put in with, <laughs> I had for like, yeah, the first sort of five years of my touring career, the best producer that Australia's ever you know produced uh as my as my dude sitting in the passenger seat in the fucking Yaris as we took on the country (laughs) we're talking about uh you know that 2007 period um when you've dropped that first mixtape and um you've ended up on uh Pegs's Burn City yep and then that was kind of like the introduction to your relationship with Pegs. And then you've dropped Long Story Short. Yeah, I mean, that was 2009. But yeah, it's all around the same, same time sort of shit. Now, when you dropped Long Story Short, was that your first release on Obese? Like, did you get signed and then you dropped that album? Yes. Yeah. So I'd, until then, I'd done the two mixtapes had been independent. Um, I've been on Fraser's Clockwork album and, and Pegs' Burn City. They were like the two big feature things that I'd had. And um, Long Story Short came pretty much straight after that, yeah. Now, when I cast my mind back to that time, yeah, Obese was the biggest thing in the country. By far. To get signed 
to obese at that point in time, I imagine would have been a massive deal. Can you recall like how you felt when you got the, you know, the green light, like you're officially now part of obese, you got a deal. How did that feel for you at that point in time? Yeah, I mean, it was it was a big milestone, bro, a big achievement. Because for the, you know, five, probably five or so years before that, I'd been a fan of everything that they'd done. They had such clout, you know, before clout was even a word, they had it. Um, you know, the they'd been home to the biggest acts in the, in the scene were all through obese, you know, every, all of them. Other than like, other than Lyrical Commission, like everyone else had kind of gone through um, the hoods, you know, B&E, Draft, Funko, like, I mean, the list just kept going, Muffin Pluto. So it was a huge thing. I was actually there the night that Thunders signed because I was in Sydney with Pegs as his hype man. This is like 2008 when Thunder signed and then being buddies with the Spit Syndicate boys, I was there with them, less through coincidence, but because it was like they were in Melbourne to sign. So I was there the night they signed as well and I, I signed maybe three or four months after they did. So it was really like this new generation and people that I was friends with and people that were coming up around the same time. Um, it was really exciting to be, to be officially a part of it and um and, and yeah you know it, it was really like it really felt like that that was the beginning of of the next sort of phase which it was so yeah because uh i think off that album you had two singles pictures and generation y and they mm -hmm. actually were placed on triple j like daytime rotation yeah so gen gen y um was the first song of mine that triple j played they played uh, my song with Phrase before that, so th they kind of like had an idea of who I was. But yeah, we gave them Gen Y. They played that um, and backed it. But Pictures was the one that they really got around, and they really smashed that, and it made it into the Hottest 100 that year. And you know that was that was really the first song of mine that sort of springboarded me. Um, into to being able to do my own tours you know we did the pictures tour in 2009 or 2010 and um and and you know that uh, that support from triple j combined with being an obese artist really meant it was a solid foundation to then you know kick on from and like if you look at it today if someone gets daytime yeah. rotation on triple j in 2022 it's a big deal with the mm. development of the scene now Back then, you know, oh wait, your stuff starts getting spun on commercial radio during the day. Again, like, do you remember that feeling? How was that for you? Yeah, I mean, again, it was, it was sort of 2009 into 2010 um, is when they really, like pictures came out a bit later. So, so yeah, it would have been just before 2010, I think. Um, I remember it well, bro. It was huge. I mean, making, making the Hottest 100 was the real, like, that was a real moment because they they were triple j were really supporting australian hip-hop um they were playing a lot of different acts but none of them were making it in other than the hoods draft i think maybe muffin pluto they were but they were playing a lot more than the acts that were making the the hottest 100 and at that time the hottest 100 was massive it's still a big deal now and it, it kind of it went from there to like sort of mid 2010s it got to its peak it's dropped off a little bit now but it was still a huge deal and um and that was really when it like it, it, that was a big statement i feel and, and again it, that gave us the 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 leverage to be able to tour because it's like okay there's definitely people all over the country that are fucking with this um let's like put on a tour and hopefully we can like not lose money and um and yeah uh, again, it just gives you the the confidence to go out there and, and, and see what's up. And you didn't win the Hottest 100 that year, but do you remember what number you got? I do. I came 66. I, I remember <laughs> I had like a bunch of people at our house. We used to have this crazy share house and um, we had a big party. And I was like out the back doing some fucking scallywag shit. And um, just hear the whole house start erupting. I'm like, what the fuck is that? 
And I went in back in there and I was mad because I was like, how the fuck did it only come 66? I was expecting it to be like top 10. I just didn't know what I was talking about. Um, but yeah, I, I've, <laughs> I think that I still got videos on like an old phone of that. Um, and like, yeah, that was a time. And then I actually went straight from that party to the big day out. I think it was one of the last big day outs because Fraze was playing. And, um, and he had me jump up and, and that was one of the first festival shows I played. So it was like, that was a crazy day. <laughs> it was like, uh, again, it really felt like a sort of statement um, out for me anyway. So. so now that, you know, you're on Obese, you've made the hottest 100, uh, you know, you're able to tour. Sounds like things are really beginning to, you know, take some momentum. Mm. 2010. Yeah. You then dropped your second album, The Chase. Yes. And that was that one was still on Obese? That was, yeah. That had a production from M Phases and I think now did did this one make number twenty five on the Australia Aria albums chart? I believe so. That sounds right. I, I I'd have to look at the I'd have to check that, but I think it was around there. And then also on that second album you had a single called It Can Wait. Um, and that one also made the Triple J Hottest 100. Yeah. So that one came in at 27 um, That on that year's countdown. And that was, again, that was like, that was the first song of mine that got crossed over and got a little bit of love on commercial radio. Um, and the chase, like, so we did a tour, me, 360 and Scripture, in mid 2010 and it was like we i put on the tour because i'd done the pictures tour made a little bit of cash 60 we'd grown up together uh we'd like he neither of us had really bubble like blown up yet he was like on the cusp but i was like all right well this is a good time like a good opportunity between albums let's do a tour so we did that and it was like a 25 date tour which was massive at the time and we it was like over three and a half months and the first so I paid for 60 in script, a fee, and I was like, I'll take the risk. And if, you know, if we make money, we make money. If we lose money, we lose money. And if all the shows were going to sell out, like if we did it now, we, they would all sold out. But at the time, it was like, we didn't have a name. So I was taking a bit of a risk. And the first two months of that tour, we like didn't, we, I was in the red, I was down bad. But then It Can Wait came out and leading into the chase dropping the, the like the final maybe 10 shows yeah of the tour came and the crowds just sort of came in and the, the, it really finished strong and we managed to break even and then maybe two weeks after the tour finished the album came out it can wait was already popping and that was like you know i feel like i in my career i have three albums that really made an impact like and influence what was happening at the time properly and the chase is the first one and you know i think that holds up to anything that came out in that time i think you can play the chase and, and it holds up to, to anything so yeah again it was like just baby steps man but they were all steps in an upward trajectory at that time and that it can wait single that not only made the hottest 100 at 27 that also went gold is that correct yes yeah it was my first gold gold uh gold plot yeah now in australia because gold gold and platinum in australia mm. is different to america so yes. when when you've gone gold with that single that means exactly what that you've sold how many copies of that single so gold is thirty five thousand copies platinum is seventy thousand um it's based on the population size so in america you know you have 15 times the population of australia so that's why the platinum in, in the States is a million and here it's 70,000 because it's done to scale. So. And then, so how did it feel to go gold off that single? It was amazing, bro. It was um, unexpected. Like, I liked the song, but I didn't expect it to do what it did. I think it was, I'm going to go out on the limb and say it was the last gold single. I, oh, well, I had one more, but it was one of the last ones that Obese put out because um, a lot of the acts by that time had, a lot of the I mean the hoods draft was, had left by the time the chase came out um, Bliss and Esso had gone years before so it was like one of the last uh, yeah 
singles to achieve that with Obese. Um, I was really proud, man. You know, I look back, that's my first big plot. Um, so it meant a lot, it still does, you know? Like, th things have gotten bigger since, but that, that album will always have a special place in my heart because of, of, again, like pictures made, meant we were able to tour. The Chase tour was the first time we were selling out rooms, you know, 500 to 1,000 cap rooms. And um, that, I, 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 like I keep saying, bro, it just, it was a trajectory upwards and the, it, it wouldn't have kept going if it wasn't for that album. Now, at this point, you know, now you're in full swing. You know, you got gold single, you got tours, you're signed to mm. Obese, you're, you're making Triple J Hottest 100. So you're starting to have some mainstream uh, success, which is great to see. And then mm. in 2011, then you've done one of the most underground things and you've jumped in on the rap attack that 360 started. Yeah. Now, <laughs> tell us a little bit about that because I remember when that was all going down and that was a really big deal. Recently, they tried to re-spark rap attack 2, which was cool, mm. but as someone that was around for rap attack 1, there's been nothing like that. That was like one of the coolest things I've seen happen in Australian rap history. Um, now, mm. for you... Who who uh, who tagged you in? Like, do you remember what number you were, and what was your thoughts of the whole rapper tag thing at the time? I I think I would have been. Uh, I can't remember what number I was. I was pretty high up. It took a little while to get to me. Um, but Jeremy or Grey Ghost tagged me in. I know that. Yeah, and it was cool, man. I mean, as, as a concept, it was like, it was good. The scene. It's so much, it's, it's such a different world and a different scene now in Australia. I mean, it's not even called Aussie hip hop anymore. I think Oz rap is the tag that they use. Um, but it's, it was a very sort of communal, like community focused thing. It was very supportive. And that's the reason it worked so well is because everyone was kind of pretty psyched about everyone being involved. And that something like that doesn't work unless you're, um, unless you know there's a, a respect between artists and like a want to kind of make it work from everyone so everyone was pulling in the right direction for it yeah no that was a classic man um you know and as the people know 360 started that one and you mentioned that yeah. you had a bit of a rapport with him so when it was before it happened because you had a rapport with 60 did you know mm. that that's something he was going to do or did you just wake up one day go on the internet and you're like oh there's rapper tag thing going on I, I can't remember, bro, but I mean, I think it was before he did, I, it was before Falling and Flying dropped. And like on that tour that we did, like Six had done a couple of mixtapes and they'd, he, like he had a following, but he hadn't blown up yet. But you could already see on that tour, like you could see what he, that he had just like, he, he was that, that dude. He, it was just it was it was predetermined that he was going to be you know he was going to be massive because he just people went crazy for him and um and when it went down the way it did it was like yeah of course this is what's going to happen so anything he was touching at that time was turning to gold and and i think it's a testament to him it's a credit to him that he you know thought to do this rapper tag shit. i don't know if he got the idea from elsewhere or where he got the idea from but like he brought focus to a lot of people who wouldn't otherwise had it because he used his sort of platform to to big up other people the year after i think 2012 uh you've dropped your third album bring it back uh that's still on obese and yes. this album peaked at number 12 on the aria charts um the lead single of it heard it all went gold again yes so now you're starting to now you're starting to repeat you know what i mean like now you're starting it's not a fluke anymore you know like now mm -hmm. you've got a second gold plaque your third album on obese how did it feel to have back-to-back -back, you know gold plaque singles it was good bro that album was like i, I had three album deal with obese and i knew my time was coming to an end with them um, I'd had interest from major labels, um, basically trying to buy me out of my contract 
And I thought, similarly to when I went from crooked eye to obese, I thought that it was in the best interest of my career to do that. Um, obviously, I'm, I was under contract. Um, I asked Pegs if he would be open to be being bought out. He he was not, and I was like, all right, cool. That's that's what it is. But um, I'll, I'll see out this contract, and then I know that what's go- I know what's going to come next is going to be a bigger platform again, because um, the majors were like, all right, well, you see out your contract, and then we'll talk. Just get get your album done. I was like, all right, cool. Well, that's you know, I was kind of working on two albums at the same time because I was like, well, this is going to be my last with uh, with Obese, and Obese means so much to to the local hip hop scene and and to the underground. And if I'm going to sign with a major label, they're not signing me to do a fucking underground rap album. So I was like, I'm going to make this album, you know, go back to my roots, and and I'm going to get all my my friends on it and make it a real celebration of the Australian scene. And so that's what we did, you know, bring it back. I mean, it means bring it back to the roots. And, um, you know, I, I mean, it's feature heavy. Trials produced, I think, 90% of it. I'd wanted to work, I, I'd wanted to work with Trials forever. So, um, yeah, you know, it was, it was, it wasn't, rushed isn't the right word, but it was done with the knowledge that there was gonna be another album coming pretty quickly after it. So I wanted to make it fun and I wanted to make it like a team effort. You know, and then the craziest thing is that yeah, it had the gold single with Heard It All, and then it won the the aria for the best urban award. So it was like, we I didn't leave obese on the greatest of terms. Like me and Pegs didn't speak for probably the last year of the contract just because he was like, well, you know, because I'd gone to him asking him to to be cool with me leaving. But it was like after the success of it, it was like, all right, well, I've I've done everything that is contracted of me that's been asked you know I've not complained I've, I've I've finished I've done my obligations and I've done it well here's here's a, a hit song and here's a, an aria and I, I I love you and you know I'm 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 about to go on the next chapter but this chapter's been great so it was like a really cool way to sort of finish that that period of time and so you mentioned for bring it back you actually won an aria for that Mm. Yeah, and so that was what best urban album for the year. That's right. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So you got the three album deal on the third album. Majors are starting to show interest. So you've asked if a yep. release is an option. Pegs yep. has said no, and then yep. that's kind of just yeah. Okay. So then for the remainder of that year, you guys haven't spoken too much, and then yeah, at the end of that album, then. Um, you've obviously left obese. Did you guys did you guys um, maintain any sort of relationship after you left obese, or that was the last time you spoke? That was the last time we spoke. I'd, I saw him a couple of times in the you know the last time I saw. Him. I mean, it's years ago now, man. But I saw him at a gig, but we didn't really chat. Um, I mean, we didn't chat, and, and you know it's a shame because I lo- like I really looked up to Pegs, and and he did a lot for me, but. You know, that's how it goes. And it's, it's, for me, it's no hard feelings, man. Like he was, he gave me a chance and, and I feel like I think that there's no drama. It's, it's such a, it's so water under the bridge. It happened so long ago. But, um, but you know, I, I definitely feel like, you know, I did, I did, I don't owe any, I don't owe anyone anything. You know, I, I fulfilled my obligations. I, you know, for the last album, I spent my own money to make sure that it was finished. We were only getting five thousand dollar advances, so it's like it's not a lot of money to make an album. You know, that's artwork, producing, recording, mixing, mastering, everything that goes into it. So I was like, I saw my contract out, and um, you know, and I still have the I have the most respect, bro. I mean, Axis is a fucking it's one of the most classic hip hop albums that's ever been released in this country. I got to tour with the dude. You know, I, I got to look up to him. He mentored me and he showed me the ropes. But when when the relationship was done, it was done. And it's like, all right, we can move on. We can, it's all good. Now, I guess just um, while we're on the topic of obese, uh, mm. you know, one of the most classic beefs, uh, I think in Ozrap history is the obese uncut beef. And I remember when I first heard uh, Brad Strutt drop Monopoly. Yeah. 
I didn't know. I didn't know straight away. Like on the first listen, I didn't know who he was referring to. Yeah, but very quickly I I, I picked up on it, and I think that dropped in around oh seven. Yeah, I was gonna say that was before my time with Obese. Um, I know, like I you know again, I'm a Melbourne boy. Stages set is a fucking classic. I like I I've met Strut briefly in passing. I've met Trem briefly in passing. I fucking you know they're they're legends so it's um yeah i mean I, I, that was before my time with obese and i'm glad because i, I actually fucking love those guns so i love that that music so yeah so then as a as a fan like before you signed to obese and you know you're obviously aware of what's going on here what did you mm. what like how, how as a fan like how do you how did you uh like find that going on and then you're a fan of lc they're beefing mm. with obese and then not long after you're being approached to sign to obese. Did that play on you at all when it came to making nah. that decision or no? Nah? nah, not at all, bro. It, it was so not like it, it had so little to, it had nothing to do with me or, or the generation of artists that I was with. Um, so it's like, yeah, you're not going to involve yourself in shit for no reason. Um, it had nothing to do with me and I loved obese. I loved, the, uh, the music I was listening to, the majority of it was from Obese, so they gave me an offer, man. I was I took that with both hands, bro. So then, uh, yeah, so your third album, Bring It Back, 2012, that's the last one that you did with Obese. And then mm. uh, your fourth album, Cinematic, now that one dropped in 2013. So I'm going to assume then that yeah. in that time you've signed to a, a major label. Yes, so I signed with Warner um, at the the start of 2013. Basically, as soon as the as soon as Bring It Back came out, uh, I moved to to Warner. Um, yeah. And did you have other offers from other major labels, or was it just really Warner that was looking at you? No, I had a couple, but um, the head of Warner at the time was a dude, Tony Harlow. He now is the head of Warner Music UK, so he's been promoted to to the nines um yeah he he was personally really invested when i finished with obese i had a couple of offers but he was the dude that had wanted to buy me out of my contract before the before bring it back came out so he'd been around for a minute and really was pushing for it and when you have the head of the label pushing for you that's a lot better than having you know, an A and R, or having someone who's not that. Basically, it's better than having anyone else chasing you. So I knew that I would be in good hands. I had personal assurances, and um, that it was really a pretty clear option, uh, a, a clear choice for me. Yeah. And then, so on that album, uh, you had uh, Draft as a feature. Now you've worked mm. with Draft before. You mm. also had the Hoods, the Hilltop Hoods mm. as a feature. Was that the first time? that you had, you know, had a song with them? Yeah. So I'd seen, I'd seen the boys in passing for, for years. Um, but I, I'd met them maybe the year before at a festival properly. And um, I, I, st I remember emailing them to, to jump on, um, to jump on coming down the song off Cinematic. Just being like, look, I got this song. I've, I know we've only met briefly, but I'm a fan. I'd love to have you on it. I think you'd kill it. And like expecting them to not even reply and they just hit back like, yeah, bro, let's do it. I'm like, what the fuck? All right, sick. Um, I was like, oh, if I knew it was that easy to get a bucket list fucking thing ticked off, I'd have been more proactive about this shit. But, um, but yeah, they, they came on, they did their thing. And I mean, it's still, you know, it's that really, I say bucket list thing and having the hoods on the track was really like, I think I say it in a song. Um, yeah, it, it was it was like a, a real a, again. I keep talking about it, but it's it's true. It was a real milestone in my career. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, because when you were on when you were on obese, were they still on obese, or they had left by the time you jumped on? No, I remember the night that the Spit Syndicate boys signed. We we're on the way out in in Melbourne. Um, we we're all in Pegs's car. And that was the, the night that Pegs like kind of told us. He's like, yo, um, you know, the hoods of hoods are leaving obese, Funkors are leaving obese. So that would have been 2008. 
Um, so this is, yeah, it was, it was bef they left just before we all signed, basically. We were like the next generation that we're going to take over from, from that. Ah, okay. That makes sense as to why you didn't meet them then because you weren't label mates. They left just before yeah. you jumped on. Exactly. They went to Universal. Like, they, they, they did Golden Era, Universal. Um, that was 2008. And then I did, you know, Warner through my label 1-2. And my label 1-2, similar setup to what the Hoods did. Um, I did, but years later, yeah. Ah, and that, that uh, label that you're referring to, 1-2... Did All Day have a hand in that? We All Day was our first signing. So we did three albums with, with All Day on one, two. Were they his first three albums or? They were, yeah. Wow, okay. And then so after that one, two thing, that's when you've signed to Warner? No, so the, the, I signed to Warner with an imprint. You know, so my own label through was just, yeah, it was through Warner. Yeah. What the Hoods did with Golden Era is yes. what you did. That's with right. One but, but years later, I mean, yeah, yeah, you kind of have to, you have to sort of prove, you have to earn your stripes to be able to get into a position to do that. So, yeah. 2013, that's when you've dropped Cinematic, which is uh, your first album with Warner. You've got the Hoods featuring on there. That's your first, you know, collaboration with the Hoods, but not the last. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then 2014, uh, you've dropped the single Tightrope. And man, that's actually on like nearly 10 million views now. Yeah, on YouTube? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that was, so that was the first song that really went crazy. Um, the album came out in... I think late, I want to say October 2013, and it, it kind of did its thing. I think it was top five, top 10 when it, when it released. And um, it had a song Young Bloods on it with, um, with Aaron String. It was like a, a remake of an Amity Affliction song. Uh, that was the first single that came out on it. And then there was On and On. Uh, and so like the, the album had been out for a while and it was kind of like, okay, it's kind of dying down. And this is in the days where you could like stagger song releases, even after the album came out, you could still put singles out and have, you know, that people would be hearing them for the first time. Um, and we put out Tightrope, man, it must've been like six months after the album came out and it was kind of like the last roll of the dice. And uh, as far as for singles off the album. And then I just remember getting a call from someone at the label like, Yo, this song's just been added across the board to Nova and SCA and all these stations. And I was like, okay, something's happening here. And then it just went, it went crazy. You know, it went fucking nuts. And that was the first time in my career that that, that shit had happened like that. And um, yeah, I think it's triple plat, triple or quadruple platinum now. Um, came in 17 on the hottest 100 that year. So it was like, by this point, this is like the fifth, fourth or fifth year in a row of, of being in the countdown. Um, you know, and, and shows started going crazy off, off the back of that song, yeah. And so now you mentioned going, what, three times, four times platinum, did you say? I think, I, I don't know where it's at now. It's definitely either three or four, yeah. And when we spoke before, when we talked about platinum gold, you said platinum in Australia is 70,000. Mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah, wow. Okay, so you're yes. talking like quarter million plus sold yeah. if you're three, four plus. Which is, I mean, it's fucking nuts, bro. Like, I, I remember making that song, like, just, I just, I used to just drive around with the beat tape around the city in my, like, busted ass VX and, like, just mumble shit to, to beats. Like, that's how I came up with so many hooks, man. And I remember I was driving up, I fucking remember it, dude. I was, like, driving up Sydney Road. I was, like, stuck in traffic. I was like, why did I fucking come to this part of town? I don't live anywhere near here. And like just sang, like, like I'm walking on a tight rope. Da -da 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 just the melody. I was just like, oh, that's good. And like remembered it the whole way home. And by the time I got home, I'd like sung the rest of the chorus. And then I just got home, fucking put it down. And um, and then yeah, but I, it's it's you know, just that moment, bro. If I hadn't have been in the car, if I hadn't been stuck in that traffic, if I hadn't have taken that trip. You know, it's like, would that song have happened? Because it just came back, it just 
came that quickly, man. It's fucking such a trip because it changed the trajectory of, of everything, you know. And would you say that's your biggest single to date? Not to date, but at the time it was by far, yeah. And then, so that was 2014, 2015. Then you've ended up on the remix uh, for Cosby Sweater. And I think it had like Horror Show Draft, Seth's Entry, Fundamentals, TK. Um, yeah, and it was like a live Triple J remix or something like that. Yeah, it was just a one-off performance for, for the Triple J's, 40, I think it was 40th anniversary. Um, so the hoods just got everyone to jump up with them and it was a big, uh, a big yeah, Friends remix. It was good. And then so, you know, obviously at this point, like shit's really starting to hit the roof now if it hadn't already. Um, then 2016, you've dropped your fifth album, uh, Two Degrees. I'm going to assume that that's still on Warner Music. Yes. Okay. And then, um, now let me just have a look at these. Uh, now this album, Two Degrees, had two singles in particular that really stood out, uh, Paper Cuts mm. and Catch yeah. 22. Yeah. Now this album was your first number one on the weekly Australia Aria album charts. Uh, mm -hmm. And it also charted at number 32 for the end of the year 2016 Australian Artist Album Charts. Um, mm. a, again, like, how did it feel to have an album go number one? Yeah, it was crazy, man. Um, <laughs> we did. It, it came out the same week that um, Leonard Cohen died. So we were, like, expecting, because Paper Cuts was the first single off it, and that that's my biggest song to date. And... That had already gone crazy. And then Catch-22 came out pretty quickly afterwards. And that had gone crazy as well. And we, so we were expecting, well, not expecting, but we were like, you know, we're in with a pretty good shot of getting number one. And then Leonard Cohen died and it's like, oh, fuck, okay. Because everyone's like going to buy, buy his stuff. And I remember we like got it. I think we did like seven or 8,000 first week. And we got the number one by like 150 units. So it was like nothing in it. Um, but yeah, that was the first number one. And it was, um, you know, I mean, I rem my girlfriend at the time, like I got off the phone. It's like, yeah, we got the number one. She just started crying and it was like, it was cool, man. You know, like you work, that these things don't matter. They're not the most important things in the world. But it's nice, you know, you look, you can't help but be reflective when that shit happens. It's like, God damn it, man, I've been like doing this for, for a long time. And, and, and to be able to have that moment, you know, it's, it's special, you know. And so Paper Cuts went, I think at the time, it went triple platinum. But if yeah. that was 2016, by now it's probably whatever it is now. Yeah, I think it's five or six now. <laughs> That's so crazy. Been, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's, that was like a, th yeah, that, that like song changed, changed my life, man. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, ca ca I mean, Catch-22 as well is like triple. So it's like, that was a good year. <laughs> so that album had back-to-back -back mm. multi-platinum singles, or at least one yeah. of them was multi-platinum and then the other one was at least platinum. Yeah. And this yeah. is after you've already got some, you know, some gold plaques. And Tightrope had done its thing. Yeah, man. It was, it was, it was like, you know, we spoke at the very start about the sort of longevity and, you know, some people like go up quick and come down quick. And, and my shit was like, it was very not that. It was like just gradually, gradually. But that album and those songs were kind of like the culmination of all the shit that had gone before it. So... It was it was a wave, but it wasn't like a big pump and dump. It, it had been building for a while. So then that was 2016, and then you've been touring. Uh, and mm. then I noticed that your next album, which was mm. your fifth <coughs> album? Sixth. Your sixth album, Space Between, right? yeah. 
So the sixth album dropped in 2019. So there's like a two, three year gap there. Obviously, you've been doing tours and whatever it else that you've so, been sorry, doing. Sorry, bro. I'll, I'll, put you, I'll put you up there. So that was... So Cinematic dropped 2013. Two Degrees was 2016. And The Space Between was 2021. Ah, okay. All right. So that okay. So the gap between album number five and number six has been like five years or something like that. Yeah, it was a long time. So the first single of Space Between came out in May 2019, and that was called Then What, which has is, you know another. Is, I fucking sound like a broken record, but that's another multi platinum one. But then the song that came after that was Lean On Me, which came out in October 2019. So everything was gearing up for an early 2020 release. And then obviously the fucking world went to shit and, um, and it, all the plans got scrapped. Just to backtrack a little bit um, off the back of the Two Degrees album. So you've dropped that 2016, you're touring it. Um, and then... In, I think it was like 2018 ish you've actually moved from Warner and you've gone over to Sony is that correct yes that's right yeah and so what was the decision making process behind that why did you decide to you know move labels again yeah well I I had a two album deal with Warner and uh, it had obviously gone really well both those albums are gold selling albums. I think Two Degrees is probably pushing platinum at this point. Um, so I, again, it was, I was at the end of my contract and the, the head who, I, who I'd mentioned before, Tony Harlow, uh, had been poached, or not poached, but he'd been promoted to, to New York office. So he wasn't gonna be involved. And he was my real champion. And then the, um, the, 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 the person I think who should have got the job was a woman called Marty Court and um, they didn't give her the job so she resigned so my two people that were were really you know in my corner and the reason that a big reason why the label they were as far as the labels concerned they were the two people who were the reason why my shit went well so they both left so I didn't really have any loyalty to anyone that was there um, that sounds a bit harsh. I, I like, I wasn't like desperate to, to it, it, it was less of a fucking relationship and it was, you know, there were still people there that I worked with regularly who I loved, but the two people that were instrumental in me being there had gone. So I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna do what's best for my career. And everyone, you know, put offers forward and Sony, again, they're, they're, what they said, what they proposed was the best thing. So it was like, all right, let's do it. And so that was 2018, 2019? That was 2018, yeah. Okay, so that was 2018. So now you've gone over to Sony. And then the mm. following year, 2019, you've ended up as a feature on the Hood single Exit Sign. Yes. Now that was a big record. Yes. And correct me if I'm wrong, that's then the second time that you had a song with the Hoods? Yeah, that's the second song. So that was, the difference being that was on their album. And, um, and yeah, that's like, you know, that's, um, yeah, I, fuck, I think that's a four or five times platinum one as well. There's like, but anything the Hoods touch turns to multi-platinum, you know that. So, um, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was kind of written in the stars that that was going to be a, a hit, and um, and it was. And I love the boys, so I was very honoured to be able to finally say that I was on a Hilltop Hoods album. Because I was going to say, like, it's big to get the Hoods on your album. That's yes. huge. But it's a bigger thing, completely. Yeah. yeah, when you get the invite to be on their album, in my opinion, that's a bigger thing. That's a like... A hundred percent because you're really going to get like all the Hilltop Hoods eyes and now they're going to, you know, you're going to come across, um, you're going to come across yeah. their eyes. and I mean, there's that element to it, bro, but more like when you're, 
you know, they're ask, they're inviting me onto their work. You know, it's not so much about who's going to hear it as much as it's like, these are people that I, like at that point, it had been, you know, I, I looked up to and, and been a real, fa like a proper deep fan of for 15 years. So like to have, to have them on my thing was, was, was a huge sort of cosign and it meant a lot. But when they're like inviting you into their world, and it's like, this is the art that we have spent the last year or two or three working on. And we have a place on it that we want you to be a part of. That's like, yeah, it's next, it's next level, you know. And how did that come about? Did you just randomly get a phone call from like Suffer, for example? Or did the label put it on your desk? And like, you know, do you recall when you went in and you first heard the song, what your thoughts were? Yeah, no, I do, man. Like he just hit me up. No, there's, there's never with the, with those boys. It's never the label stuff and and industry shit comes afterwards. We'll speak directly. Um, so it was just him, like, yo, we got a song. You want to jump on it? And like, fucking, I don't care what it sounds like. You didn't even need to send it to me, man. It could be fucking cats meowing and like just static as static sounds as a drum beat. Like I'm I'm on it. Um, but then he sent it to me and thankfully it sounded a lot better than that but um but yeah as soon as, soon as the offer came as soon as that call came in i was like yeah i'm down of course didn't even think twice and did they tell you why they because obviously they can have whoever they want on whatever records they want did they mm. did, did they tell you why they specifically thought you would fit on the record or why they invited you in particular to be a part of it no, I mean, they didn't need to. Like, you hear the track and it sounds like something that I would fit on, you know? And um, it was dope because I know Sarah... So, Eka Vandal sings it, but the, the girl who wrote the hook is... Her, her name's Sarah Ahrens, and she's one of the the best songwriters in the world. She writes for everybody now. She lives in, She's lived in L.A. for the last five years. She's, like, one of the biggest. But she actually went to school... Uh, like she went to a high school in McKinnon. She went to uh, she went to a high school where my parents live now, basically. So that like I'd known of her for years, and we'd sort of circled around um, each other for a few years through mutual friends. So to actually be on a track with her as well, it was like dope. I got some of my best buddies, and this girl who's an absolutely incredible songwriter. It was like, yo, this track's a hit with or without me, but I'm glad I can be a part of it. And so that single's gone multi-platinum. Then two years later, so 2021, that's when you've dropped your sixth album, The Space Between. But yeah. in between Exit Sign and you dropping your sixth album, you've put out a single or two in between yes. there that have, and, and the, both of those singles also went platinum? I know then what is double now and lean on me i think is gold but probably knocking on platinum's door around now so yeah so then those so, so then exit science got multi-platinum then you've dropped these other two singles one of them's gone double platinum one of them's gone mm -hmm. gold mm -hmm. and then those singles ended up on the album in 2021 the space between that's correct that's right yep and then um on that album, obviously, like they were the singles that dropped before it. Was there any other notable features or singles from that album or they were the two standout? They were the two standout. I mean, I had a song called Loose Ends, um, excuse me, with, um, with G Flip, which came out in the middle of COVID. Um, but COVID fucked the whole rollout for that. You know, we weren't able to tour it. Um, I, I regret looking back. I mean, you weren't to know. But I held off touring for Then What in 2019 because I was thinking that we were going to do a big tour at the start of 2020. So when that, um, in, in hindsight, that was a dumb move because you kind of lose all the momentum. Um, and then the, the rollout, I mean, fuck, dude, the last couple of years, you know, it's just been impossible to be, you can't plan any of it. You can't, just didn't know what was going to happen from week to week, let alone three months in advance to plan an album rollout. So yeah, it's, um, it's just, it, it is what it is. I, I really like the space between, but it didn't really get a fair chance to do what it should have done because the world was just gone to shit. And you know, in the scheme of things, 
it's not that big a deal. Many people were going through much more serious shit, but um, but it's still it's a shame because it's a great album and I don't think it really got the love it deserved. Now, one of the interesting things about that album is, well, first of all, I think that went number one on the Australian Aria charts. Um, and also, when you listen to it, it's, for lack of a better term, perhaps, it's a bit more of a pop album than it is like a yes. rap album. And you've actually got Guy Sebastian as a mm -hmm. feature on there. So... Mm. Why the, I guess, the transition, the transition into the more pop sound, is it something that came from the label saying, you know, we think that you should go more in this nah. direction? Or is it something that just came from you, you just wanted to go in that direction? And if so, why? Yeah, it didn't come from... I, I've never signed a deal in my life where I would give away creative control. Like even at any point. So any decisions on creativity and the direction come from me and the people that I'm working on the album with. Um, as far as like the sound, bro, I mean, I don't think it was too much of a departure from Two Degrees. I don't think it was too much of a departure from Cinematic. There's less rap, there's more sung stuff, but it's shit that I wrote, you know? Like, I, all the big songs, I, I, they, yeah, there's other people singing them, but for the most part, I've written the, the choruses. So it's something that I've done since pictures, you know, since the first time people like heard a song of mine that had a feature singer, it's been shit that I've written. And I've got better at it. And I still love rap, and I can still write a verse in 10 minutes, and it'll be at least decent. But I've gotten better at writing songs, and that's something that I find challenging, and it's something that I enjoy. So it was always going to be like a natural progression for me for going into the more, not even pop, just not hip hop, you know? So there's songs on there that are like all sung, but I've had songs in the past that have been all sung. I think people, I started to have songs that were mainstream hits with a frequency that meant people weren't digging into the albums. They just hear what they heard on the radio and make their calls. And that's fine, but it's not accurate. Um, so there's rap songs on Space Between. This is a long answer. <laughs> I'm aware that I'm waffling, but um, but yeah, it's it's it, it it shits me a little bit that it's that it, the rap songs aren't given the the love they deserve. Because there's a track on there called Wave. It's the intro track, and I think that's one of the best rap songs I've ever put out. You know, but it doesn't get the love because people hear the singles and like, oh fuck, it's just a pop album. It's like, nah, man, you fucking dumbass. Listen to the songs. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the guy Sebastian thing, I mean, that's an easy target. The guy's an incredible fucking singer, man. He's, yeah, he was on Australian Idol and he's a pop, he is a pop dude. But he's not going to deny that. No one's denying that. But he, fuck, man, you get that, you listen to that dude sing in the studio. Bro, he's talented as fuck. And, he's, and, and he made that song. So that song is about my, um, well, it's about people passing away. And uh, like the last verse is about my grandma dying and, um, and, and my last sort of moments with her. And he brought an emotion to that, that, you know, not many people could. Like I brought an emotion to that, but it's my experience, but he's featuring on a track and it's not, he's not talking from my experience and he's still bringing out that emotion and that's not an easy thing to do and only so top elite singers can do that so there's your long ass answer <laughs> no it's a good answer that's a very good answer yeah. that's exactly what i was hoping <laughs> it would be annoying man like because i know how it works it's like yeah you're the, yeah. you're that classic you're that classic example of you start where you started you've progressed to where you are and then people are only checking the big singles and yeah. then, the, the, which is not necessarily reflective of a whole album. It might not even be reflective of half the album. Do you no. know what I mean? And uh, yeah, you're right, bro. And like, I, like I've never been in it for. Like, I know who I am, and I've never really put on a front to be something I'm not. And I've never been that really street dude. I, I was always in it for the music. I was in it for the hustle. I hustled on the side to make the music, but it was never about being that tough guy. And it's not my thing you know so I've never gone into it with that I've always been who I am but at the same time I know I make good fucking rap music and I know when they talk about like 
keeping it real and all that shit. Man, when I put out Tightrope, I was in, uh, you know, when that shit was going nuts, I, was, I went to New York and I was in an office in Midtown with a contract on the table with a lot of zeros on it. And all I had to do was sign that they were going to release Tightrope in the States. They'd already signed up a pop singer, a big pop singer to re-sing it. I'd heard the track with, I'd heard the hook sung, so it was done. Uh, all they wanted me to do is change my voice, like change my accent, rap in an American accent. They wanted to re-release it like that. And I said, no. And I turned down a lot of money and a big opportunity. And then the same thing when paper cuts happened. I had offers from the States, but they wanted me to change my accent. And I'm not doing that. I can't go back home. What I've built up back home means too much to me. So it's like, I've been in that position. I've been there with the piece of paper on the table and the pen in the hand. And I know that I kept it fucking... You know, I, I kept it authentic to myself. And it shits me because when people want to have shots, it's like, bro, put yourself in... The, I think 90% of the dudes, if they had the opportunity, might handle it a bit differently than I did. So, you know, I, I mean, it is what it is, bro. But it's... um, I, 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 sleep, I sleep comfortably at night, put it that way. Just to retouch, because I, I, I'm quite fascinated by this. Like, so to me, when I hear... Uh, when I hear the name Guy Sebastian, I think Australian mm. Idol. I think the biggest name I know of from Australian Idol ever. I think of a huge pop star. Um, again, when you guys collaborated on that record, was it similar like the Hoods where it's just pick up a phone call and you talk or is that done through the label or how did that come together? Yeah, that was done more through the label because he's obviously been with Sony for I think his entire career. Um, so that was that was done through through people at the label um mutual connections I'd, I'd met guy a few times but i didn't have that kind of relationship with him um so yeah and then when you did the single were you both in the studio together writing it and recording it or was it you know out of the studio sort of process no yeah i had so i'd written it um and we kind of sent him the track and he just replaced my vocals i spoke to him i think we spoke on the phone as he was recording it, just sending files and be like, oh, can you do this slightly differently? But at that point, I was traveling all over the, like, all over the world and so was he, and it was just getting to a point in the album where it was hard to be in the same place and the, and the song needed to get finished. So it just, it was an economical use of time. Recently is when you've put out um, your new single, Like You, but now that one's, you're back on Warner. Yes. So again, what made you make the decision to go from Sony back to Warner? Yeah, I mean, again, it was just the, what's in the best interest of my career. Um, that, so Space Between came out last year, started last year. It um, did its thing. And then it was hard because Melbourne and Sydney were both in crazy lockdowns. There'd been some changes at Sony. People that were, were able to make decisions and, and sort of pull triggers on you know signing off on on budgets and, and stuff weren't there so the the label was kind of like it was kind of what's the word it was kind of like uh in what's the fucking word it was just unable to move it was just stuck so like we were i was in the states and i was like yo i i i'm here everywhere everywhere back home is locked down i got this song so i had like you ready to go it's like, I want to shoot a video while I'm out here. And we couldn't even really get approval for that. So like, it, it just became a thing of like, okay, it's all love. I love the people at Sony, by the way. The people I worked with were fucking amazing. But it was just like, I just need to do what's best for my career. And, um, and Warner, you know, they were under new management. Dan Rosen, who's someone I've known for a long time, reached out and he was like, look, we'd love to have you back. And... I was like, yeah, you know, this might be the, the right, right thing to do. And so I went back and I don't regret it. Yeah. I think the pandemic, if the pandemic hadn't happened, like, cause the space between's rollout was so affected. And I, I know there's so many artists that are in the same boat, but, um, but yeah, it, it got so affected by the, by the pandemic that it's one of those real well, what if moments um, amongst the billions of what if moments of regarding the pandemic. But, I don't know if, yeah, it's just, it's just the way things played out, you know? 
And so that brings us all the way up until now. <laughs> um, so we've it's tried a long to way, cover bro. It. Yeah, <laughs> man, it's a it's a hell of a run, man. Um, and hopefully, yeah. you know, it's not slowing down anytime soon. And yeah. um, now, just to wrap up the interview, just some like generic questions that I tend to ask most people. Um, a couple in particular, I think, are uh, very suited to you because of the relationships that you've that you've got with certain artists. Um, yeah. One thing is like. Uh, First of all, you mentioned that like you and 360 have had a relationship, you know, since the early days. Um, and one of the most epic moments in Australian rap history, in my opinion, was the Curse of 360 battle. Um, mm-hmm. I think that was like 2010. Were you tuned into that and were you pretty tight with 60 at that point in time? And can you remember what your you know what your recollections were of that or you weren't really tapped into that when it happened no i mean i I was aware of it i don't know if me and six were super close by that point was it 2010 around 2010 yeah right yeah um yeah i don't know i i remember i just remember seeing it and thinking it was a fucking entertaining battle man and like you know i think that i can't remember people's opinions on i think it was pretty split between who won but I think, I think Cursor, I think Cursor um, sort of, I think you can look at where hip hop's at in this country now and, or rap in this country. And so much of it goes back to Cursor's influence. You know, I think a lot of the Oz rap now owe a huge debt to that dude because he really, when, when there was no one like him, he came out and was like, I'm the sickest. And it was like, who the, what the fuck is this? But he, he backed it and wrote it and he's still here, you know, 12 years later. Um, and you look around at the scene now and, and they've, they've, there's so much of his influence in it. So it's like, it was pretty pretty big deal. I feel like it was later than 2010 because I'm sure Falling and Flying was already out. And now you're right, you're right. You're right because yeah. in, the, in, the, in the battle he goes, Fallen flying. Fallen I'm flying. flying. I bought I'm it. Lying. I'm lying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, like, I think, um, you know, for sixty, who was at that time, other than the hoods, was the biggest act in the in the country, and then for Cursor, who who wasn't who was known, but what he his influence was going to be felt a long time later. It's pretty wild when you think about it. Like, a lot came from that battle, you know. And was, because Cursor had a stint on Obese Records, when he was on Obese, were you on Obese or that was different? I think I'd just left. I think I'd either just left or maybe there was a little bit of overlap with, um, with the Bring It Back era, but I don't think, I think I'd left, yeah. And another thing that I, that 360 had a hand in that I don't think gets talked about enough but it's on the internet. People can check it out and I hope they go look at it after they hear this interview is, do you remember the, um, the top bill and cipher with 60 pairs and, uh, who was it? 360 pairs and Seth Sentry. Do you remember that? No, man. man. (laughs) Go look at it when you got a moment. (laughs) When you, when you said that thing about, you know, keeping it real, yeah pez pez has the funniest line something to the extent of um like you guys talk about this keeping it real shit that's exactly what you're doing you're keeping, keeping it real, it real shit, shit. Uh, <laughs> i feel like i that. know that line but maybe i have seen it before somewhere yeah another thing that i wanted to ask you and i think you're a great you're a great artist to to get the perspective on this question because it's something that's been talked about for many years, everyone's got different opinions, is mm. the impact and influence that Triple J has had on the Australian rap scene. Now, mm-hmm. the, the reason I think you're a great person to ask this question is because you come from that, I guess to my understanding, you come from that, you know, real traditional Melbourne hip hop background. Mm. And over time, uh, without trying to, just in a genuine, organic manner, like the hoods, mm. Mm. you have transcended into a more commercially acceptable, 
you know, world, for lack of a better mm. term. Um, you got the underground heads that kind of tend to rag on Triple J because they're like they won't, they will only play a certain sound. These this pocket gets no support, and then you got the people who have had success through Triple J, basically saying the opposite. Because you're mm. someone that kind of started over here and then ended up over there, um, and you have had the support of Triple J. Um, mm. What's your take on the impact and influence of Triple J on the whole Australian rap landscape? I mean, there's so many aspects to that. I mean, like Triple J changed, you know, they changed my life, their support. So I'm, I'm, I'm writing for Triple J regardless. Um, you know, I've had friends at the station, friends have been there and the friends have left, friends who are still there. Um, they've had a huge impact. I would say that I understand where some criticism comes from of the station, but they have a dedicated hip hop show and how has run that really well. My Jupiter before how, um, that, does showcase a lot of stuff that otherwise wouldn't get played, like that doesn't get played nationally anywhere else. But I don't know what, you can't expect a station that's meant to, that's demographic is, you know, teenagers and early 20s, young adults, you can't, they, they have to cater to everyone. I don't know it's, if it's realistic to expect some underground rap to, on a station where they have to, cater to fans who don't like rap full stop that like indie music or that like fucking electronic shit you there's not enough hours in the day to support everyone in that and it's just for better or worse that's just the reality of it man so they have the dedicated you know shows that support the more that, that dig a little deeper into different genres and they have one for hip-hop and how does a fantastic job of it but on the, the sort of through the days and through their sort of more broad programs, what are they going to do? Like they've got to cater to everybody, man. So I guess that's kind of my answer on that. And as far as what they've done to change the landscape, I mean, a lot of dudes now with, with, the, the, with how important social media is and online stuff, like you can kind of create your own world regardless of, you don't need radio anymore. You know, it helps, but you don't need it. If you're super compelling, um, people, the, particularly you know, younger people, will find you, um, and they'll find you regardless. They'll, they'll bypass all those traditional media outlets. So I think people are really doing that, and it's, you know, for better or worse. Again, I, I mean, I they've changed my life. They changed my friends' lives, and they they're all well intentioned. They're not like shutting people out because they have a grudge or a chip on their shoulder. It's just the fucking reality of how many hours in a day they have in their programming their demographics so you know it's that's just that's just it man it is what it is it is what it is bro you know if it was up to me they play nothing but hip-hop and fucking shit all the time but they, you know then they would have no they'd have a much smaller if they were able to just cater to hip-hop heads then they would you know they would do that but that's not their brief they have to treat everyone equally for you mm. If I asked you your top five Australian rap acts, it could be an artist or it could be a group. If I mm -hmm. said to you all time, hmm. not in order, just the top five that come to mind, who would they be? Top five, Suffer, Pressure, Draft, Jimmy Nice, one more, who's the one more, Solo. I'm forgetting, I know I'm forgetting people. Yeah, Solo from Horror Show, but that's like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm just going to go with that. That's five, right? Off the top. I'm forgetting some, I mean, a fuck. Trials, <laughs> I mean, it's, if we keep going, I'm just going to turn this into a lot longer list. So like, yeah, <laughs> let's say with top six. <laughs> now, if I was to ask you the same question, but in terms of like, uh, I guess the new school or the, the, mm. the younger gen, for lack of a better term, who are the top yep. five that stand out for you? Yeah. Um, okay. I'd say Nerve. I think Babyface Mal is going to be a problem. Um, one, four. Um, Husky. 
and I say a girl. Okay, cool. Now, out of those five, I'll pick a couple for you to just break down a little bit. Uh, when you say husky, why husky? Because he his album was like a throwback to the shit that like I grew up on. The, the, it, his shit was a throwback to the scene that really doesn't exist anymore um, or it doesn't exist as, like it used to and it was so fucking fire front to back and it's just just hard as nails man you know it's like it was great and it got I think it got number one which is fucking amazing so yeah and another one that you mentioned in there that stood out for me was 1-4 um, why'd yep. you put 1-4 in there I think they've been the biggest sort of revelation in, in rap and drill in Australia. I, th I don't even think it's debatable. Um, they've kind of, there's just, they were just orig original and unique. And, um, you know, the controversy that surrounds them, the quality of their music, they're just fucking, yeah, it's just awesome. It's just so engaging and so entertaining. And, and, and it's like, I think that a lot of people have sort of, taken their playbook and ran with it but they were the first ones to really put it on the map and, and yeah you know it's just good music bro now you also mentioned babyface mal he's somebody that yeah. uh was only on my radar for maybe the last six or so months yeah you know you you, you mentioned the you, you make the comment you think he's going to be a problem why do you think that what is it about him that makes you think he's going to pop off and have some big success I think he's dope. His like f flavor is a little different. I think he's he's either bilingual or multilingual. Um, so he has like a lot of he's able to just flip shit in a really cool way. Um, you know, we've played a couple. He's, he's supported me on a couple of shows. Um, he's got a couple more coming up. He's good live. He's good. He's a good dude. He's hungry, but he's humble. But he's got swag. He's like, yeah, man, and he's from Melbourne. I needed to put someone from Melbourne on that list. So, like, you know, for me, he's ticking all the boxes. Yeah, and he's he's probably the he's probably at the earliest part of his career of all those people. Um, but I, from speaking to him, I know he wants it, and I know he's hungry. So it's like, yeah, man, go get him. And my last top five question is: if you look at it right now, you look at the game yeah. right now, and you were to treat the the cities in the state like an afl or basketball ladder you know from number one to number five if you look mm. at it right now this one's in order who do you reckon's the top of the ladder at the country and then work it down to the fifth spot <laughs> fuck it's a good question i mean my, who gives a fuck what i think but i would say like it's either got to be it has to be either adelaide or, or sydney Fuck. Yeah, you'd say Sydney's probably topping it at the moment. But no one in Sydney is doing sold out arenas and the hoods are. So yeah. I mean it's between those two for the top spot. And then third what like <laughs> that's a good question, man. Yeah. Maybe Brisbane and maybe Melbourne and then maybe Adelaide after that. I mean sorry, Perth after that. But yeah, that's, a, that's a hard. I mean, it really, at the moment, it's West Sydney and Sydney in general, and then Adelaide with, you know, what, what, what T's doing with AB Original and, and the Hoods. Um, yeah, I don't know. After that, I don't know, bro. I reckon, the, I reckon there's a, top, a joint top one and then a joint three-way tie for third, fourth, and fifth as well. Everyone else got to pick their act up, that's for sure. <laughs> the, the, the lesson. Oh, yeah.